Tonight we got a little bit of ground to cover. A couple of things I want to uh, share with you first, because this isn't just a healing service. It's also for you to know how to minister. And the real essence of it, and I can, if you go in the manual, we have the how to minister healing, and it's uh, steps there, and you can see it, but it, and it looks like a lot, but it's really not. It just flows. But the real, the real uh, key to it is very simply this. <clears throat> Speak what you want the end result to be. That's it. That's, that's what you'll hear me do. Be healed, head to toe, every organ, every limb, every cell, every tissue, healed and whole, restored, whatever it is, it's always the end result. <clears throat> Just speak the end result, right? And command it to be healed, right? Command the thing to go. There's, there's several different ways. You don't have to do all of it. You can say cancer, go. You can, you can say life. You can say be healed. I mean, the, the, the whole idea is what are you looking at? What are you thinking? What are you wanting to happen? Because that's what you're going to release. And so it's really simple. Anytime you're ministering to someone, just speak the end result. What do you want the end result to be? It's just that simple. And then just say it in the form of a command or in a way that it has to obey. Now, I will tell you, <clears throat> when you start uh, sickness, disease, and even demons, they don't think they have to obey you. They're not used to obeying Christians. They're used to Christians saying something and then quitting. Wow. Right? And so many times they will hesitate to leave. Just because they know if they don't leave right away, most Christians will give up. And so we want you to be able to know that no matter what, now you can, and people say, well, you know, should I pray several times? Do I pray one time? You know, what do I do? <clears throat> you pray until you know it's done. If that takes you a hundred times, you do it a hundred times. It takes one time, do it one time. You say, if I pray a hundred times, I mean, is that, isn't that an unbelief? Wigglesworth said if you pray a hundred times, you pray 99 times in unbelief. <laughs> okay? Okay, let me put it this way. I will not pray one more time than I have to. Amen? But I'm not afraid of praying several times. Why? Because I'm more interested in you getting healed than I am, you know, my reputation or my, or any of that stuff, right? What counts is the people get healed. That's what, that's what counts. <clears throat> so, and there can be times when you pray and you know you're not believing. Pray again, you know, stop, back up, pull yourself together. Sometimes there'll be other things on your mind and you have to actually focus. You actually have to push that stuff out. Why? Because the enemy will try to flood your mind with different things you know, I'm fi you fix a pray somebody. Well, you know, did you lock the door at your house? Yes. Well, I can't do anything about it now. Might as well get it out of your mind, right? And he'll do things like that to you. And so you just pray and you command and you expect it to be done. Amen? It's that simple. Now, here's the real key, though. See, people think of terms of praying and they think, okay, pray once, pray twice, pray this. It's not that, okay? What you're doing is you are releasing into them Life, right? So when you release life, you release life and it drives out sickness. It's just that simple. It's just like if I take a bottle and put, you know, dirt in it, you know, mud, then I can take that bottle, well, let's just say a, a clear liquid. We'll start with a clear liquid. I can have a clear liquid and I can start putting food color in it. <clears throat> and when I put that in there, it's going to saturate the whole thing. And the more I put in there, the darker it'll get or the, the more of that color it will get. Right? <clears throat> now, let's take another example. Because that's what you're doing. You're putting life in. It has to go everywhere. It goes mainly to the part that's needing it. But it, it goes throughout the whole body. Now, let's do another example. You take a, <clears throat> let's say, well, we'll just use a Coke bottle. How about that? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. <laughs> And you've got a 16-ounce Coke bottle, okay? And if you've got eight ounces of, of Coke in it, well, let's just say water, whatever, liquid, eight ounces, okay? <clears throat> now, it's in there, and let's say you fill that thing up. Let's say it's let's say 16 ounces of Coke. We'll just go ahead and use it that way. And that way, it's, it's, there's a color to it. And that thing is full of Coke. And you take that bottle, you take the lid off, you put it under a faucet, you turn the faucet on, 
Clear water is going to go into it. Pretty soon it's going to overflow. If you leave the clear water flowing in, pretty soon the whole bottle will be clear. Why? Because the clear water going in is forcing out the Coke that was in it. That's all we're doing. You are a finite vessel. You have so much volume in you. We put life in. We keep putting life in until it flushes all the death out. So is that one time, two times, ten times? It could be one time for this and five times for that. Usually based on where you are. Let's say you have prayed for people with, um, let's say cancer. You pray for people with cancer. Uh, and you've seen them healed, just bam, bam, bam. It's just amazing. You're impressed. You're amazed at it, right? And you're like, wow, this is awesome. <clears throat> and so someone comes to you with cancer, and you say, oh, yeah, cancer, bam. You hit it, yeah, and you walk off. Why? Because you're used to that. You've got victory there. Somebody comes up and says, well, uh, I have a tumor. It's not cancer, but it's a tumor. Brain tumor, let's say. <clears throat> okay? But you hadn't seen brain tumors healed but you've seen cancer healed. Well, if you can't relate the victory of the cancer over to the tumor, which we've talked about, if you can't do that, now you may have to pray, you may have to lay hands on that person three or four or five times with the tumor. Why? Not because it necessarily has to have it, but until, because you don't have the same degree of faith for that that you do for the other thing, right? So the key is you minister life, you put life in, you let it fill them up and overflow. And the more you do it and the more different kinds of things you minister to, the better you get at it and the less you start having to do it for each person. So you might have to do it one time for a person with cancer because you're, you're good at that. That's where your faith is. You can release your faith real quick, but maybe the tumor you've never seen before, so you may actually have to go after that a bit to get to the place where you believe that it's done. Amen? You can't believe that God can do it. You can't even believe God's going to do it. You've got to believe it's done. When you lay hands, it's done. And until you can believe it's done, you have to keep laying hands. Right? And, now, and there's tradition that says, you know, you can't lay hands more than once or you're in unbelief. Who cares? Bottom line is, get the person well. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Don't let doctrine stand in the way of somebody's freedom. Amen. Amen. See? Yeah. <clears throat> you wait. The, the little girl, y'all saw the video with the girl with the, with the ankles? You know what I'm talking about? Where she can't walk, she has this thing. And when I, it's you know, amazing because her friend came to me and said, listen, my friend is here and she is really ready to give up hope and she doesn't even know if she should be here in the healing service. I said, why? She said, she's been prayed for by everybody. She said, nothing's happened. She's really, really discouraged. And I'm like, she said, she said should she get in the healing? I said, yeah, absolutely. And she said, well, do you think it'll do any good? I said, I know it will. And she said, why? I said, because she's had everybody lay hands on her. I said, they've been putting in life, putting in life. She's probably this full. I said, I'm going to lay hands on her and take it over the top. And it was, she was already mostly full. I said, we're just going to add two. See, that's the thing. When you pray, see, here's the question. The real question is, uh, you know, when people say, do I, can I pray two times, three times? Whatever. The real question about that is that, okay, are you... If you think that every time you pray, that means the last time it didn't work, so you're starting over and trying this time, then you're wasting your time anyway. You are not starting over. You're adding to. Amen. And every time you add to, they get a little more full, possibly in that sense, and when they get full, it's all driven out, it's flushed out, and they're well. Right? And so I tell people all the time, um, Clement Humbard. Do y'all know Clement Humbard? You ever heard of Clement Humbard? Mm -hmm. Rex Humbard's brother. They were the ones that put Catherine Kuhlman on television way back. And so I was in a meeting. They actually I flew into Dallas. I was coming home from a long trip. We flew in. Uh, I got a call on my phone as soon as I landed. It was a lady in Hot Springs, Arkansas. She said, listen, I'm putting together a meeting uh, because these people asked me to do it. And she said, I've already bought you a plane ticket. The plane is waiting there. It's going to load here in a few minutes. You need to make your way down. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> I didn't even know who this woman was. And she's buying plane tickets and telling me where I need to go and all this. You know? And I'm like, I, and I called my daughter and said, who is this woman? It's, you know, telling me all this. And Rebecca said, this is who it is. And this is what she done. And I'm like, 
What is she talking about? Well, she put together, she, well, it wasn't her, that somebody approached her and said, would you find a place to meet? <clears throat> and because they knew she had this little prayer house out in the middle of the woods outside of Hot Springs, Arkansas. And <clears throat> she's, the people that put it together were people from Benny Hinn's ministry, uh, Oral Roberts, Rex Humbard, uh, a bunch of people, right? And they said, we've been hearing this, but we want to hear it from him. So we want to come there, and it's a little bitty house out in the middle of nowhere. They said, we want, and we want him to come there and teach us this and to share what he's teaching. We want to know what he's teaching straight from him. And I said, and she said that she put it together. <clears throat> so I told her you'd come, so there you go. Said, okay. <laughs> so I went on down, gathered my bags, went in, caught another plane, flew to Hot Springs. <clears throat> they picked me up at the airport. They drive me out in the middle of nowhere, out in this little, to this little bitty house. Used to be a drug house. And this woman went out there and cleaned it out, ran everybody off, renovated it, and turned it into a prayer house. Amen. And so when I got there, I walked in the room, and I, I'm looking at These are people I grew up watching on television. You know, I mean, I, I, from the time I was small, I mean, young, just should say, I guess, young. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I was you know, really humbled and honored to share this message with them. And so we spent three days there, just me, every morning me talking to them every day, talking to them, and then uh, <clears throat> while, we're, while I'm teaching, somebody would come up and knock on the door, and she'd open the door, and they'd say, uh, God told us to come here, and we got in our car, and he said, turn here, and turn here, and go here, and here we are. And didn't even know what was going on. Nobody knew what was going on. But the Spirit of God led these different people there. And so we're there, and all this is going on, and then, so finally, uh, Clement Humbard uh, said, uh, was sitting right there on the front, and he said, I've had these back problems. He said, show me, do this. I said, okay, so put my hand on his back, commanded healing, told him to do what he couldn't do, he began to do it, was totally healed. So he went and got a, a copy of a book that I'd heard about, but he had an original copy called, uh, it was by Dr. T.J. McCrossan, uh, Healing in the Atonement, Bodily Healing in the Atonement, right? Uh, Kenneth Hagin actually had it reprinted years ago, but I had one of the originals that, now I have the original, because Clement Humbard had one and gave it to me. And it was a lot thicker. They had edited a lot of it out. So I'm preaching to these people, right? Yeah, there it is, right there, it is right there. That's it, yep. <clears throat> and so I'm uh, preaching to these people, and, and th these are people that I respect highly, right? And so I'm, I'm watching what God is doing with these people and healing them and answering their questions and things. And they were all basically saying, okay, here's this. And, the, you know, they wanted my cell number. And so we started talking, and I started talking with them. And then uh, by that time, too, we had gone out to um, Sid Roth. And then Sid Roth put us on his program. And then <clears throat> while we're there, you know, we we're inter being interviewed. And he, what Sid Roth does is he'll gather six months of people that he's going to interview and gather them all up. And then used to, he would fly them all to Orlando where his studio was. And then we'd stay in a hotel and for a couple of days and just record all the programs. And so <clears throat> he flew us all in there, and there was a couple people there that, were, they, Sid likes to start fights. <laughs> He's, he is a character. I mean, and he stirs stuff up, and he, he interviewed everybody else, and he saved me for last. That means I had to sit there and listen to all of them. And so, and he knew what I talked, because we'd already talked. We'd, we'd already, we had been out to a Red Robin to eat one night, and I was telling him, he said, you can do this anywhere? And I said, yeah, we can do this anywhere. And so our server came up, and she said, you know, can I take your order? And he looks at her and goes, are you sick? <laughs> you know, and she's like, no, sir. No, no sir, I'm not. I'm, I'm fine. Said, you know, because it's not good for a server to be sick, right? <laughs> and no, no, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. And he said, dang. <laughs> she looked at him like, what? <laughs> you know? And so we're still talking. We're still, still, still talking about stuff. We get up to leave and we start to go out. We walk past this table with a couple of women there, and this woman says, uh, Sid, Sid. And so he turns and goes, Oh, and started talking. What are you doing? I hadn't seen you in a long time. Oh, this is my friend. I brought her up here. We had to take her because it was, um, his, this was actually in, um, what was it, Brunswick? I think it was in Brunswick, where we were at. <clears throat> and um, he, he said, She said, I had to bring my friend here up because she has uh, cancer and it's, it's final stages of cancer. So we had to bring her up and have some stuff done. And Sid Ross says, looks at her and goes, So you have cancer? 
and, and, she, and she said, yeah? He goes, great. <laughs> and this woman looks at him like, I hate you. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, just, you know. <laughs> and Sid, he's standing there, he goes, great. Can I introduce you to Curry Blake? This is Curry Blake. Curry, pray for this woman. And this woman's looking at me like, I don't know Curry Blake. Who, who is it? And so I said, do you mind? She said, no. And so I prayed and God healed her. Right? And he, he told me later, we didn't know it right away, but she didn't feel anything. I didn't feel anything. God healed her. And then we went in to do the, the recording of the broadcast. It was a radio broadcast because he had me on for two weeks on the radio. And then when we went in, we went into the studio. And at that time, his uh, producer uh, was a, a, a lady. And I don't know who his producer is now, but uh, his producer was a lady at that time. And so he's interviewing me 15 minutes, 15. And so we're doing two weeks, but we're doing it right then. So we'll do 15 minutes and then we'd break. And he'd say, uh, we'll be back tomorrow with tomorrow with the rest of this tomorrow. And he'd go on it. But tomorrow isn't tomorrow. It's 15 minutes from now. You know, not even 15 minutes. Usually it's five minute break in between. And so <clears throat> that's what he's doing. And then he, so he sprung this on me. He didn't ask me. He just said, uh, when I went back, he said, okay, we're going to do the next broadcast. I said, okay. So he brings in his producer. And he said, now, uh, Curry doesn't know this, but my producer <coughs> has been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, five tumors in, in the breast cancer. And he said, uh, and we're going to have him pray for her right now. I'm like, okay. You know, it's not like, oh, no, I'm not ready. Wait, I've got to go get prayed up. No, it's not like that. You know, it's like Jesus is always ready. Yes, right? And so I said, okay. So he had me pray for her, and I commanded healing. Did it. And so we stopped. He said, and we'll be back tomorrow with the results. <laughs> we don't have 24 hours. We got about five minutes. And so he said, uh, he called her name and said, go, go to the restroom and check yourself because the tumor she, she could tell. So I'm like, okay. So she goes and comes back and he, they keep us separated. We don't see each other or anything. And he has her sitting in a chair with her back turned to me and he come, brings me in, sits me down, my back to her. And then he says, you know, welcome Mishpaha. We're here with you. And he starts going this whole thing. He says, yesterday, if you remember, because he's so dramatic, you know. <laughs> yesterday, if you will remember, we had Reverend Curry Blake, John G. Lake Ministries, just uh, pray for our, our producer uh, with cancer. And, uh, and, just, uh, and he goes, and now we're going to get the results. And so he had us both turn around, and she turned around, and he goes, and he called her name and says, what are the results? What's happened? And she said, all five are gone. Wow. Right? <laughs> and so... And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know? <laughs> so, so, but every time we minister, we command. We command the body to be healed, or we command the disease to go, or we command healing, or anything. But it's not what you say. It's the fact of who says it. You got to get that. It's not the words. It's not a magic formula. It's, it, it's who says it. You are connected. You are the branch connected to the vine. The life of God himself flows through you. Amen? And there's nothing that can stand against you. Why? Because you're connected with God. And he is for you. Amen? Amen. Now, in this I wanted to share real quickly just a couple of things too. Um, years ago, in, in the house where I was praying for everybody and everybody's getting healed. Okay? When it first started, and I started this story a little bit today, but I didn't get too far, and I didn't want to go back into it all. But I started going into Walmart, and I just start crying. And one time it got so bad that I went straight into the restroom and went into the very back stall and just shut the door and locked it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just crying. I'm like, God, I, I don't even see a sick person yet. And this is going on. you got to do something good. Because it started, it started affecting me to the degree where I actually got to a place where I'm, I'm like, who I lay these hands on will live, and who I don't will die. And it, it got so heavy, and it got so, because it's real, and it's real life. I mean, imagine if you, you know, found a vaccine, or a, that's part of the bad worst word, wrong word to use, <laughs> but let's say you found you know, a cure for HIV or something that was kind of a medicine or something that actually worked, 
and actually got people healed. And let's say you, you had it, you discovered it, and you go, wow, this will do it. It's killing the, the virus every time. That's amazing. All right, what, what am I going to go work on next? And you just leave it sitting there. You would be guilty of every person that died from that time on with HIV because you had the, the cure in your hand and you didn't do anything with it. And so as I started realizing how real this was, how, how, how life or death this was for people, it started weighing on me, and, I, and, and I, I, I was trying to share it with people, but I couldn't get anybody else to do it. Nobody else would even, I had one guy that would go with me, and he was more or less being a historian and documenting stuff. I mean, he wasn't even really involved in anything. And so I ended up in this bathroom stall in Walmart, and I leaned up against the wall, and I'm just crying, and I'm weeping. I mean, I'm heaving. I mean, I'm crying so hard, I can hardly breathe. So I just lean against the wall and I just slide down on the floor and I just start shaking and I'm, just, and I'm weeping. And finally, I realized what's going on. I said, God, you, you, got, you can't do this. I've got to stop. This has got to stop. Or they're going to come in here in a little while and find me just sitting over in the corner going, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I said, because this is, this is too heavy. I can't do this. And he started saying, you've got to get people to do this. And so <clears throat> this is all going on. And during this whole time, we were in this house. And this is before everybody was coming. Well, they actually started coming. But we were, it, it was toward the beginning of it. And then one morning, <clears throat> I had uh, I, awake or asleep. I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't really tell. But I remember I got out of bed. And it was just at, before you know, it gets daylight. It's like you can see. You can make out forms. But it's not bright by any stretch. And I got out. <clears throat> and I started walking toward the room. My wife woke up because when I got a bit, I woke her up. And so I'm walking toward the, the front door. And my wife gets up. And my daughters, I think, are still living at home at that time. And she was watching me. And I, she said she was calling me, but I didn't hear her. So I'm walking to the front door. And my wife goes by the girl's bedroom. And she goes, y'all, get up. There's something wrong with your dad. There's something going on. I don't know what's going on, but there's something going on. And she's, so she's talking to them. And they're coming out. And now they're watching me. And they're talk, trying to talk, but I don't hear them. And I just walk to the front door. I open the front door. I step out in the front yard. And as I get out in that front yard, what they see as I walk out the door into the front yard, what they see is me doing like, like this and like this. And I'm, I'm doing this and doing this. And I'm moving. and I'm trying, and th But they can't see anybody. But what I'm seeing, my yard is covered with people sitting. All kinds of clothes. I can see people from India. I could see people from Mexico. I could see people from Africa. I could, all kinds of this. And they were all in like their, their uh, traditional clothing. My whole yard, there was not space in between them. Me stepping between them was really hard to do. And when I stepped out, it was like I stepped into a bubble because I couldn't hardly breathe because it was like so hot. And yet there was a, a, a smell. And I recognized that the smell was from rotting flesh. So I'm stepping out in here, and I'm looking at this, and, I'm, and, and these people, you can hear this kind of moaning and all this stuff. And, and I'm trying to look, and I'm trying to tell them, it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It'll be, it'll be okay. And I look out to the road, and there's a driveway, and then there's a road. And the road goes down, and there's a T that goes out to the main road. And this ambulance was backing, which is weird, but it was backing, turned the corner, backed right up to my driveway. They threw it in park. I mean, you could tell. It was like, er, you know, it stopped real quick. They jumped out, ran around the back, opened the door. Oh, very quick, very quick, like they were trying to hurry. Grabbed the stretcher, rolled it out, put it on the side of the road right there, slammed the doors, jumped back in, took off. As soon as they got out of the way, another one came. And they were just dropping these people off. Boom, 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 boom. And they were lining up. And I'm looking at this, and I'm walking out there, and I'm looking, and there's an empty field right next door. And I'm looking at this empty field, but it's not empty. People, all the way across my yard, all the way across that field, same people just sitting there, just moaning, hurting, sick. It, it was, and it was so overwhelming, I just started crying. And I remember crying, I'm watching these people, and I'm looking down the road, and I can see all these people on stretchers and wheelchairs and canes and crutches and all this kind of stuff. And I'm watching them, and I start to cry again. And I'm like, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't get to everybody. I can't get to everybody. I, I, I need help. I need somebody to help. And it was like, literally like Jesus was standing, you know, somebody gets right up against you, right behind, put their head over your shoulder and whispers in your ear. 
and, and I knew it was Jesus. I mean, I, or I, you know, I'm assumed it was Jesus. And he's, he, and as I'm looking, I'm like, I need, I need help. I can't do this. I can't reach all these people. And right that time, I turned and looked, and right on the side of the road was this guy that had these wooden block things that had handles. And he was on this little wooden thing that had wheels. And he was sitting down, obviously, on, you know, sitting down, had his, it looks like he had his legs back behind him. But he was sitting down, and he would put these things forward, move forward, and then do it again. I mean, he was moving not even a foot every time. He was really short, and he's struggling. And he'd move forward, and I saw him reach back and grab this, like a burlap sack, almost like a canvas bag, and grab this and pull it up, and then he would do it again. And he'd pull that up, and he'd do it again. And it's taking forever, so I saw him, I'm like, no, 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 you don't, have, you don't have to come. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. And so I walked over to him, and I'm, I, I, I'm not, he's not speaking any language per se. But it's like, I know exactly what he's thinking. It's almost like we're talking without talking. And so I'm looking at him, and I'm like, is it, is it, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You don't have to come. And he, he shook me off, and it's like, no, you, no, you don't understand. And, and I look, and he pulled this sack up, and he opens this sack up, and it was his wife's body. And I realized he had no legs. And I'm looking at him thinking he has no legs and that's, it's, it'd be okay, you know, you'll get legs, you'll get legs. And he was like, no, 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 you don't understand, I'm not, I'm not here for me. I want my wife back. And I said, bro. And I'm looking at across this field and that's when I look back and I'm like, I can't do this. I need help. And that's whenever I, I believe, I believe it was, I don't know, it was the voice of God, was an angel of Jesus, I don't know. You know, I didn't turn around and look and all that kind of stuff, I, I don't know. And I don't even know if I would have seen anything if I had. But I just know, I remember hearing, and I figured it had to be Jesus because of what he said. He said, now you know why I ordained the 12. Now you know why I ordained the 70. Because I couldn't reach everybody, and the need was so great, I had to have help. And from that time on, literally, I've run as fast as I could. I've gone as many places as I could under all kinds of conditions, regardless of what, and I'm going. And then finally about, oh, six years, seven years, eight years later, something, maybe even longer, I was in Denver, Colorado. And we were at a church. We had about 1,400 people there. And we taught the DHT. And it was the first time, see, for years, I did it all myself. I did all the healing service myself. And then God told me, you, you're, you're undoing what you're teaching. You can't tell everybody they can do it, and then you do it all, because now you're saying you don't trust them to do it, and they're, you're reinforcing the fact that they can't do it, but you can, and you're undoing everything you've been teaching. And he said, that's what I do. And he just, let them do it. Let them start ministering. I said, okay. So that, that night was the first time I said, here's what we're going to do. How many of you have been here the whole time? They raised hands and said, okay, if you've been here the whole time, you're going to pray for people tonight. I gave them instructions how, and I said, now, line up around the walls, bam, go after it. So they did, and they went after it. And while I'm standing there, they're praying, it's loud, and there's commanding, and, always, and people are throwing down crutches, and people are getting healed. I'm not touching any of them. And it's all happening under the hands of the people that had sat through the train. And I'm standing on that platform looking at this, and it was the first, or the, the, it was the next time that I heard the voice of God. Because I was standing there and I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, we can do this. We can get it done if we can get the people doing this. And I remember saying, as soon as I said, we can get it done. And he was like, yes, we can. And I realized that's what we had to do. And I've done it that way ever since. I, I don't, I try my best not to be. As a matter of fact, even when I do, uh, you know, I, I pray for everybody. I have no problem with that. But then I also, <clears throat> God showed me a way because what I try to do is I try to pray first. And then I will have, and generally what we do is I will have everybody lined up. I'll pray first, and then I'll go down the line. And whoever I pray for, then they come behind me and they pray for the person. And then whenever they get prayed for, they get So everybody that's been prayed for is now praying for somebody. And the reason I do that is because if I pray first, 
and everybody else comes behind me and everybody else, let's say in this room, and everybody else prayed for everybody and you get healed, guess what? You can't say, oh, Brother Curry. <laughs> you see? Why? Because you can't pinpoint whose faith did it. Yep. And so God showed me that that way people can't puff us up. Right. You know, because I don't, I don't care what your motives are. The enemy's always trying to puff you up. So you have to look for ways to make sure that that can't happen. You have to, and, and honestly, you start believing, you know, you, the things people say about you, you're doomed. You, you can't take that. You know, if people, if people complain, you got to take that and go, okay, I'll fix it. You know, I'll, I'll do what I can to fix it. But the people that brag on you, you got to go, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and and it's, it's just got to go straight off of you, straight up to him. Amen. And they're oh, you know, you did this, you did that. Yeah, isn't he great? Isn't he amazing? And say so what? Because I can't afford to think differently. Why? Because I want to. I want to do this a long time. I don't want to fall prey to the enemy's tactics. And so we have to do this in a way that it causes the the enemy not to have an inroad. We have to put up these things so that the enemy can't get in. Does that make sense? And so now. After that, I'm trying to think when it was actually, you know what? No, it was actually before that. Yeah, it was actually before that. Remember I told you, I, I saw things, I learned some things, and I wished it had all been at one time, and it just naturally went there, but it didn't. It was like this way, and you'd learn something, and then it'd be a distance, and you'd learn something else, and eventually you kind of put it together. Well, <clears throat> early on, I was going to uh, Assembly of God Church. It's an awesome church. It was the church to go to in that area because I'm telling you, it was awesome amazing, amazing worship. Uh, it was really during the uh, Pensacola revival time period, and it was very similar to a lot of stuff there, and it was really amazing. And so uh, I, well, I wasn't in full-time ministry. In my mind, I was, but I, mean, I was working other jobs too. And so I was there, and I went to the pastor, and I had a great pastor. And I told this pastor, I said, you know, I want to do something. Whatever you want to do, I'll do it. You know, usher, greet, I don't care. Just I just want to serve, you know, find something for me to do. And so we were looking at different things, and I did, and I served in all these different capacities. And so finally I told him, I said, you know what? I want to teach a Bible class. Can I teach a Bible class? And he said, yeah. Well, actually, because he's a good old southern boy. He said, well, Brother Kerr, if you want to teach a Bible class, we will put one together for you. <laughs> I'm like, great, let's do it. Let's, let's do the Bible class. And so he said, well, what would you want to teach? I said, I don't know, you know, maybe, I guess, Bible doctrines. We'll just start with that, something simple, you know, and, and we'll just, just do Bible doctrines. And he said, all right, well, we'll announce it. And so we set it all up, and we got everything ready, and we had our first night. And I get up there, and I wasn't used to preaching. I was not used to it at all. And, and so these were supposed to be 45-minute uh, classes, roughly, and they, they go about an hour at the most. But first 15 minutes in, I am not used to talking. And so I'm up there, and I'm going, and the first night was the authority of the Word of God. And I'm talking about the authority of the Word of God, and about, you know, 15 minutes in, I'm like, and the, author the, the authority of the Word of God is it. And I'm, you know, it's having some time in my voice. And so went on, got through it. This friend of mine came to me, said, the second week we're back. This friend of mine came to me and said, Brother Curry, I noticed that you're having a bit of problem with your voice. I said, yeah, not used to this, you know, and. He said, well, there's an old preacher's trick. I said, what is that? He said, it'll help you preach longer. I'm, like, I'm for it. What, what, what do we do? He said, well, <clears throat> he said, um, <clears throat> there's this old thing. If you take a Sudafed, then it, it does stuff to your voice so that you can preach longer and it makes your voice last. And I'm like, really? And he said, yeah, it'll work. And I said, okay. I, I did. I said, I've, I've never been, I've never really taken medicine. So I don't know what anything does, right? <laughs> I've never done drugs, never tasted alcohol, never none of that. So I don't know any of that stuff. And so he brings some Sudafed. He brings it to me and he gives it to me. And the third week, uh, he starts, uh, he, he says, here's this, try this. And I'm like, okay, so before I preach, I take the Sudafed, drink the water. All right, we're going to get started. And tonight, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is where the power is. You need the power, so you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I started going into an Acts 1-8, and you need the power. And, all, and I'm going on, and man, about, you know, I don't know, probably I guess about 20 minutes in, something like that. I'm going on, and all of a sudden, I'm like, glory to God. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! 
Woo, he's here. Oh, everybody get up. Turn on the music. Get the music going. And I said, hey, you just do this, man. Let's go get, get around the walls. Everybody line up. Turn the lights down. Get the music. Woo, I can't feel my legs. <laughs> can't feel my fingers. Glory to God. The anointing is here. The anointing is here. I said, so everybody get around the walls. And so we had them all line up around the walls. I said, glory to God, here we go. And so I just started going down in the name of Jesus, be free. In the name of Jesus, be healed. People were, ah, and they'd fall down. It was amazing. People were falling all over the floor and all this stuff. And I'm like, glory to God. Yeah, and I'm hitting them kind of hard because I can't feel my hands. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't tell how hard, you know. So I'm just going through. And I'm going through this bit. And, and we get done with it. And I'm like, whoo, glory to God. Lord, God. And so then I, you know, I, I think, I, I don't even know if I can drive home, you know? <laughs> and about another, I don't know, 45 minutes and, you know, the anointing had lifted. <laughs> so, you know, we had to report to the pastor what was going on. So I told the pastor, wrote all this stuff out. And Sunday morning, you know, I'm sitting on the front row over there because that's where all the, you know, Bible school teachers, Sunday school teachers, all that set. So I was sitting over there and our, our pastor, uh, he gets up to me and he goes, well, I don't know what's going on in that Bible doctrine class. <laughs> we had 13 healings. We had 12 deliverances. And we had four breakages of addiction to tobacco. <laughs> I'm like, you know, and I'm sitting over on the edge and I'm like, yeah, coach, let me in. I'm ready to go. Let's, woo -hoo, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. <clears throat> so the next class, it had doubled. Everybody came in there. Everybody wanted to come in and see what's going on in the Bible doctrine class, right? So this thing's going on. And after the, you know, we talked about it, he said, Brother Curry, we are, because you had to be a member of the church to go to the Bible doctrine class. He said, we have never had a Bible doctrine class where people join the church just to go to the Bible doctrine class. <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm like, I, I told you, we can do this. We know what we can do. And so the next, next uh, class night, I'm teaching on the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues. And I'm like John Lake said, speaking in other tongues, making of his ministry, and you need to speak in other tongues because it edifies you and builds you up, and it's like this dynamo inside of you. It generates spiritual power, and you just pray in tongues. Now, but remember, before I did it, what did I do? I took a Sudafed. Worked in my voice pretty good, right? So I took a suit of fed and I'm telling them how much they need tongues and they need to do all this. And so, and all of a sudden it's like, you need to speak in other tongues. When you speak in other tongues, glory to God, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> he's back. <clears throat> you know the drill. Get against the wall. Turn up the music. Yes. You know. Yes, Lord, we will ride with you. Yes. You know. Woo, yes, this is good. You know. And I mean, we're going through there and laying hands on everybody and everybody's getting healed and all this. Stuff. And it's amazing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, see, this is it. And this friend of mine says, hey, I need to come home with you tonight. We need to talk about this stuff. This is amazing. I'm like, yeah, come on over. We get on my front porch and it's a little up off the ground. And he's like, you know, he said, you know, I'm, I'm filled with spirit, but man, I, you know, I, I need an extra touch. I'm like, and, and the anointing is still present. I can still, barely, barely, <laughs> but it's still there. And I'm like, okay, in the name of Jesus, and laid hands. He fell off the porch. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <clears throat> and so it goes on. Pastor's talking about it next Sunday. And, you know, it's like, yep, this is happening. And it's amazing what God is doing. And, and so I get in there in the next class. And I'm fixing to start teaching again. And this friend of mine comes up and says, uh, Brother Craig, I know you're able to preach now. You, the Sudafed's working for you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's helping pretty good. And preach longer is, is good, doing good. He said, well, are you noticing any side effects? You no, know, like what? Hey, well, you know, some people can't do, can't take Sudafed. You know, uh, you know, you can't feel your legs. <laughs> <laughs> do tell, really? <laughs> huh? That's 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 something, isn't it? That's something. Yeah. He said, "Yeah, you know, I just didn't know if you were feeling any side effects." And so I'm like, "Okay, well, we got to get started." So that night, it was like, "Okay, no Sudafed." Didn't think so good. I got in there and I'm like, all right, listen, uh, here's the class. I mean, it was the deadest, driest class you could have because I, I had to hurry up and get done because I had to go talk to God, <laughs> right? And I mean, I get done and I'm out of there and I'm driving to God and I'm already talking, God, what is this? You got to tell me. People are really getting healed. People are really getting blessed. These things are going on. What was it? 
What happened? You know, why, how is this happening? Was, was, was it, is it the anointing or is it Sudafed? You know, is it, is it <laughs> which, which was it, you know? <clears throat> is, is it real or is it Memorex? You know, okay, let's see, now I'm showing you my age, right? And I'm like, God, this is real. I said, okay, what's happening? And he said, listen, he said, you were waiting for a feeling. And when you had a feeling, you acted anointed. He said, you could have acted that way any time and it would have worked. But you believed it when you felt something and then you've acted that way. And see, this was <clears throat> a, a different time from whenever I went out to that little church. So we'd seen some stuff. And that's what I'm saying. See, I never, I've never sat and listened to this in one thing brand new. It was pieces and putting it together and two steps forward and one step back and all that kind of stuff. I wish I could have sat and heard it all at one time and then went and put it all into practice because you can start. You don't have to start where I started. You can start where we are now. And you get to launch. See, if the church is always having to go back and start over, we'll never advance. The church is supposed to start, the next generation starts where the last generation ended. And, and the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. So you see, we have to realize that you can do whatever the Bible tells you to do. Amen? Amen. Now, we, I wanted to, um, yeah, um, I do want to give you a scripture, and I want to show you something. Today, uh, we were talking about the anointing. And I just want to share one last scripture with you, and then we're going to get to, to ministering. <clears throat> and remember what we said about, he said, that because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Isn't that right? Yeah. Because you're sons, which means you had to be sons before he could send the spirit into your heart. You got that? Yeah. Now, in Luke chapter 4, in verse... 16. It says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now notice, okay, think about this, all right? He went into the synagogue as was his custom. He regularly went to the synagogue. There's no record of him teaching until this point. Here's the word of God in the flesh and yet, here's, here's the one who, who knows it all. He didn't need to go to the synagogue to learn anything. But he went to the synagogue every week, as was his custom. And it doesn't even say he ever taught. Right? <clears throat> he went there. He had a custom of going there. It was his habit. Now, if Jesus felt the need to go to church every Sunday... Sabbath, you understand, I'm relating over. How much more do we need to be there? Right? I'm, I'm not saying that going to church is going to make you anything other than depending on what you hear there and what you do and all that kind of stuff. I'm saying you need fellowship among like-minded people. The worst thing you can do is hear something like this and then go back out and never fellowship with anybody. Don't get around other people that believe the same thing. I'm telling you, it'll die in you before long. So you need to connect with people. You need to plug in. You need to... To, to, to know people that you can call and say, what about this and what about that? You need that fellowship. And, and maybe, you know, maybe you didn't, you're not learning anything. We'll go there to help teach, like we talked about before. Help share, you know. And so it's important that we fellowship. <clears throat> and the Bible says that we not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And it doesn't always mean in a building like this. It could be, you know, in a corner of a fast food restaurant. That's what we did for years. You know, the jack-in-the-box up there in Denison, Texas, where that church was at, that was our annex for the church. <laughs> right? We'd get done with service, and there was a group of probably about, I don't know, 10 guys and their wives and, you know, another 20 kids or whatever it was. We'd all go in there and just take over the jack-in-the-box, and we'd sit there. And we, of course, we'd order food and eat and that kind of stuff. We'd sit there and talk for, I mean, usually till midnight. Because we enjoyed the fellowship. And that's when I was learning this stuff. And I'm sharing this stuff. And we're going back and forth. And we're debating. And, you know, sometimes even almost arguing. But those are some of the best times I remember. Amen. Just because we're fellowshipping. You have no idea how much, really, I crave fellowship with people that believe like this. It's not that easy to find all the time. Right? And so it's good to fellowship. It's good to hear different things. I want to hear your testimonies. I got testimonies. But I want to hear yours, and you need testimony. If you don't have any, go get some. Yes. Amen? 
the heathen are your inheritance. That's what the Bible says, right? <clears throat> Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it, he said, and I can give you the heathen for your inheritance. Go get some inheritance, right? Go make disciples. That's what you're here for. You're not here just to be discipled. Everything has to, you have to be a disciple and you have to be discipled and you have to make disciples. It's a process. Get involved. The more you, the more you share, listen, teaching is the second learning. When you teach, you learn it better. You don't know it till you taught it. Right? Because that's when you really think about it and you think about the questions and you take questions and all these things. And so it's important that you fellowship, that you get around this. Now, Luke chapter 4, verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So he did this on purpose. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Spirit of the Lord. You got that? Because he hath anointed me. You hear that? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. What does this mean? This mean, notice, anointing and Spirit of the Lord. Right? He didn't say anointing twice. Why? Because first you get anointed, then, there's, then the Spirit of the Lord comes. Didn't I prove that today? Yes. So here Jesus is the perfect example of what I was teaching today, that he said, listen, the Spirit of the Lord, the power of God is with me, because he hath anointed me. He didn't say that the anointing empowers me. He said the power is with me because I'm anointed. In other words, I've been placed into a position and because of that, he has sent his spirit upon me. Do you, do you get this? Yeah. This is Jesus. <clears throat> now notice, because. If there's a because, it means because. There's something there, right? Something had to be there first for it to be a because. So Jesus is saying, the Spirit of the Lord, the power of God is present with me because he has anointed me. He put me in this position. Listen, because you are sons, the, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. Because. It's the same thing. We're just like our big brother. We get born again. We get appointed, anointed. That appointment is into a position. And because we're in a position, now we need uh, the ability to back up that position. The, uh, we need the ability to back up the authority that comes with the position. And so we have the authority of the position, but now we need the ability, and the ability is the Holy Spirit who comes upon us after we're sons so that he can back up the authority he gave us. You get that? Yeah. So because you're a son or daughter, it's, you know, together, because of that, his spirit comes upon you. So if you weren't his son or daughter, his spirit couldn't come upon you that way. You got that? And that spirit didn't come and go. He abides. <clears throat> John Lake wrote a letter in 1911, April 22nd, 1911. And he's, he wrote it to a woman named Carrie Jeb Montgomery. If you don't know who that is, you ought to check her out. She's an amazing woman. And so uh, she had a house out in uh, Alameda, uh, California, right there by San Francisco. And I've been there a couple of times. It's still there. It's an amazing place. And it was a missionary home. And missionaries would go overseas and send their letters back to her. And then she would distribute them throughout the United States for them and to share with, with people what's going on. And he wrote her a letter, and he told her the secret to the great miracles he was seeing. And he said that the secret, I'm giving you, it's in your manual, if you have a manual, it's in the manual, and it's a letter from John G. Lake to Carrie Joe Montgomery. It's in the very back in the uh, supplement section. <clears throat> and in it, it says, he said, Sister, I've enclosed some of these things uh, to, to show you what's going on. And then he says, and we have found that the secret of our ministry here, the secret of this aggressive ministry of healing that the Pentecostal movement in South Africa has experienced is this, that we teach, listen carefully, that we teach our workers to command sickness and disease to go and that they have received the power of God when they were baptized in the Spirit. So when they got baptized in the Spirit, the power of God is there, and they teach them to command. He said, whereas in some parts of the Pentecostal movement, they still intercede and intercede with God to drive the devil out or to take the devil out, whereas we don't do that, we command, right? <clears throat> and then he gives examples where he actually shows how they command and examples from the Bible, right? <clears throat> And so he gives examples of his own life, how he learned these things. So all I'm saying is that what I've taught you this week is what John Lake taught back in 1911, right? 
and it still works. And the amazing thing is, most of the church still hasn't caught on. And that letter was sitting in the uh, Assembly of God archives for over 100 years. And then when I found it, I realized, wow, look at this. And he talks about a missionary uh, in Valparaiso, um, Venezuela, uh, Valparaiso, what is it? Yeah. Chile, Chile, yeah. Because I was thinking about Valparaiso, for all of a sudden I went to Valparaiso, Indiana. <laughs> we were, okay, you want to talk about Valparaiso, Indiana? I got miracles there. <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you, you ought to do this. You ought to do what I'm doing. You can do what I'm doing. And you ought to do it because I can drive down any road in America and take any highway. And as I got people riding with me as we drive, I can say, now up here, there's a, a cutoff. This road's going to go down there. And if you go down there about this far, there'll be a, a city there. And, and this is a miracle that happened there. Any, any city. We've been all over this place. And, and every place is the same. And whenever we were in, speaking of Valparaiso, Indiana, when we were there, there we were at the National Guard Armory because that was a building that would hold the people we had. And we started sharing. And I shared a testimony from a, a meeting I had in Florida where a little girl was sitting there and she had a serious food allergy. I mean, it was bad, it would kill her. And she was sitting there and we were in a house and we're sitting there and I'm teaching and we get done and her father's there. Her father was a, um, a tester, uh, a, you know, a lab tech basically, for a drug company that did medicines and that kind of stuff, right? And so he brought her there and so we're teaching, get done. And he said, would you pray for my daughter? She has a very serious food allergy and it was about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night, because I preach deep into the night, like the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and if you leave early, you miss the dead racing. So and that's what happened with the Apostle Paul. So, so we were there, and he said, would you pray for my daughter? I said, yeah. So we prayed, and he, he said, now, wh wh where can we get some, because her allergy was for seafood. And I said, well, I don't know. Everything's closed. I don't know what we're going to do. And he said, well, we want to test this while you're here. Okay, and I'm like, okay, I don't know what to tell you. And the lady said, well, I've got some frozen shrimp. He said, I can, I can cook that up for her if y'all gonna be here a bit. And we, I said, go ahead. So, you know, this little girl sits down at the table and all these adults gather around her and watch her eat shrimp. And, you know, I don't know if they're waiting to watch her swell up or what they're waiting for, but everybody's watching her. And after a little while, everybody got bored because nothing happened, right? And she got completely free. Now, so then I was in Valparaiso, Indiana at the National Guard Army. We were fixing a break for lunch. And I tell everybody, listen, and I'm just fixing to walk off the platform. I said, okay, everybody go to lunch. I said, wait, 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 wait. Matter of fact, I said, who in here has food allergies? And there was about five hands, I think, that went up, which I would expect a lot more than that from that size of crap, but that's what the hands went up. I said, okay, let me tell you this story. So I told them that story. And I said, so right now, if you go out, you can eat anything you want. If you go out, you'll be healed if you go eat whatever you can't eat. And they're looking like, really? I mean, this, you didn't even pray. I said, you go. They went out and they came back. And when we got back, first thing they did was take testimonies. Guess what? They'd all gone out. They all ate. They all were healed. Wow. Amen. Amen? Now, okay. Now, now, now let, me, let me tell you why I did something. I was in our home where the people got healed, everybody that came. A man that came to me, he said, uh, I work at a movie theater and the people there don't like me because I'm a Christian and they're doing this stuff and they thought they'd pull a trick on me and somebody, they never found out who, but somebody put mercury in his drink and he drank it and didn't know it until it went in and, he, and uh, with a short period of time, mercury poisoning set in, his skin turned silver, gray, I mean it's really gray and he was losing weight. He looked like he had HIV, actually. Lost weight, got real frail, couldn't, couldn't keep it. everything he ate, just throw it right back up. It was, he was dying. And so he came to me, and he said, this is what happened. Would you, would you pray for me? And I said, yeah. So we prayed for him. And well, actually, what I did was I told him, I, I didn't even pray, actually. He said, would you pray for me? I said, uh, yeah. I said, uh, what kind of food do you like? He said, well, he said, you know, I like different kinds of food. And I said, well, if you could eat anything you could eat right now, what would you eat? He said, man, I'd love to have a I think he said, it's, uh, I think it was a taco from Jack in a Box. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you have low standards. Anyway, <laughs> you know, okay. I was a manager at Jack in the Box. I can talk about it. Okay. So, so he, I said, and he told me what it was. And he said, I, but I would love to have a milkshake. 
from Jack in the Box. That was the main food he wanted. And I said, go drink a milkshake. And he said, really? I said, yeah, go drink one. He said, bye. <laughs> Took off. I didn't see him for two weeks. Didn't know what happened to him. Hadn't heard anything. We went out to the mall one day, and here he comes walking down the mall. Different man, different color to skin, had gained weight, came out of a Mexican uh, restaurant, had a toothpick in his mouth, and he was just walking down the mall. And I looked, and I said, man, look at you. I said, what happened? He goes, I'm healed. He said, I've been eating anything and everything. Wow. And I'm like, glory to God. Amen. So I, I, I didn't even tell him. I didn't even pray for him. Now, you say, okay, great. How did you know to do that? Did you hear God speak to you today? No. You know how I knew to do that? I'll tell you how I knew to do that. I read Smith Wigglesworth's life story. See, I read Smith Wigglesworth, and Smith Wigglesworth one time told a man he had one foot. He didn't have another foot. And so Wigglesworth said, go down to the shoe store and buy a pair of shoes. And the man went down to the shoe store. Now, I talked to Albert Hibbert, which was Wigglesworth's chauffeur, and he knew this firsthand. He was, he was there. He knew the man that this happened to. And I talked to him. I called him. He was in, uh, actually, he was up in Minnesota, I think it was. Albert, yeah, he was, uh, no, George Stormont was up in Minnesota. Uh, Albert Hibbert was still in, in uh, England. When he, you, you don't care. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a historian. I like the details. So, <clears throat> but... He, he said that this man went down to the shoe store and told the man, said, I need a pair of shoes. And the guy looked at him and said, uh, is this a joke? He said, just get the shoes. Just get, I need this size shoe, just get the shoes. And the man came over there and he put on the first shoe on his regular foot and then he took the stub of his other foot, put it in the shoe and a foot grew on. Wow. Right? <clears throat> right? Now, notice he didn't pray for the man. He just told the man to go down and get some shoes. Right? And so... Now notice, Jesus didn't pray for the man with a withered arm. He just said, stretch forth your hand. Isn't that? Why? Because all you have to do is get them to do what they couldn't do. And when they do that, the miracle occurs. So I'd read that. And see, most of the things I've done in my life, all I've done was remember the stories of these guys that have done them before and just go do them just like that. If God did it for Wigglesworth, he'll do it for Blake. Amen. Amen. If he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. Why? He's no respecter of persons. He wants the glory. Amen. Healings bring him glory. Amen? Just remember, don't ever steal his glory. Amen. Right? That's what um, <clears throat> Dr. Summerall used to tell us. He said, listen, if you want to be effective in ministry and you want to last a long time, there's three things you've got to do. Never, don't touch the girls, don't touch the gold, and don't touch the glory. Amen. Isn't that simple? Amen. The three G's right there. Right? <laughs> don't touch the girls, don't touch the gold, don't touch the glory. Right? Don't go after any of those things. Stay safe. Those three things are what brought, has brought down any ministry that's ever fallen. Right? And you just have to stay away from those. So whenever Dr. Summerall said that, I wrote those things down. And if you look in the beginning of your manual, you'll see where it says, uh, <clears throat> these are our basic operating principles. There's things I don't do. I don't travel alone. I mean, unless I absolutely have to, but I try my best never to travel alone. alone. I don't meet with people alone. Why? Because it's not what you say or what you don't say. It's what they say you said or didn't say. So I always usually have somebody with me that can verify, no, Curry did not name him as his successor when he dies, right? Be surprised to people that want to do that kind of stuff. I've had people come out of the woodwork. Well, you know the prophecy by John Lake, that was really for me. I'm like, really? Yeah, that was for me. You know, this happened to me when I was a kid. I'm like, have at it. Go do it. You know, you want the responsibility of it? Have fun, right? I just assume just go to Walmart and pray for the sick. You know, I don't... I, I don't have to have a position. I didn't have a position when I started. I had a need. Right? So it's not about position. It's about meeting the needs of people. Amen. And so all these things, all I did was I just imitated these guys. I read their stories. I read it and read it and read it. And then I looked in the Bible and backed up the things and then I went and did it. And I just remember these stories. And so I remember the first time I've been reading Wigglesworth, right? And so I, because I like Wigglesworth, I like Lake. And so I'm reading Wigglesworth's story and uh, his daughter, I've actually met two of his granddaughters, and so I, I was reading there, I was reading his story, and he had a daughter named Alice, and his son-in-law was named James, James Salter, who was a missionary in the Congo. And so I'm reading this story, and James is telling the story, and he said, you know, Wigglesworth, the way he started every meeting, is he would step in and he'd say, all right, <clears throat> whoever stands up first gets healed of whatever they got. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. And so... He said, uh, uh, James Salter, his son-in-law, said Wigglesworth would get up and say that. And James said, every time he said that, I would just sink down in the seat because he thought, 
Oh, no. He said, because you see, I didn't have Wigglesworth's faith. <coughs> and so he said, I was afraid. He said, but you know what? It always worked. He said, whoever got up first, they got healed. They ended up getting healed. And so when I read that, I thought, you know what? If he'll do it for Wigglesworth, he'll do it for me. Yep. Right? And so I, so I guess what I did? I tried it. <laughs> you got to experiment with things. Right? And so I tried it. I, I remember the first time I went to a meeting like that after reading that. And I got up and I said, you know what? Who in here's got pain? Who got some severe pain? Cut? And the hand went up. And I said, and I said, okay. I said, listen, watch this. Now it's it's a it's a variation, but it was just it was my own I guess personality, right? And I said, all right. And the hands went up all over the place, pain. I said, I'll right, watch it. Now just to prove to you that what I'm going to tell you is true and that it works, I said, watch this. In the name of Jesus, pain, spirit of pain, false pain, tormenting spirits. I command you in the name of Jesus right now in Jesus' name, go. And I said, all right now. You that had pain, check yourself. I said, who got healed? The pain is gone. Hands went up everywhere. Now see, Wigglesworth didn't do it just like that, but it's the same principle, right? I've done this same thing. I did it in Ukraine. And I think, I don't know, George, you'd probably with me when I didn't. Would you, would you with me there? Where were you with me that we did that? Well, we did it in, Por we did it in Poland. We did it in, uh, I did it in Peru. Uh, I've done it in languages where people couldn't understand me. Right? We did it in Ukraine. We've done it in, we might have done it in Germany. I think we did it in Germany if that's true. I'm not sure. But, so we've done it everywhere we've gone. Why? And the, the first time, I'm telling you, the first time, oh, it wasn't quick. It took minutes. And I gave a command. I said, all right, who got healed? Nobody moved. Everybody's sitting there. I could feel the sweat start. <laughs> you know? And I'm just sitting I'm just, but I'm waiting, right? And then in a few minutes, I mean, it wasn't a few minutes. It was, you know, seemed like a few minutes. Right? And all of a sudden, it's like, boom, and it was one. I'm like, I see that hand. I see it right there. There's, a, there's one. There's one. Up, oh, there's one. And it was like, pop, 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 pop. It was like popcorn. It started slow and then built, got faster. And so the first time I did it was the hardest. After that, it got pretty easy. And so I started doing it all over the different places and everything, and it started happening. And why? I tried different things. I was in Grand Junction, Colorado. And I, it's the same place where the metal came out of that lady's back. It's over in the picture over there. And uh, I was having the healing service. And this was back when Benny Hinn was waving his jacket. Remember that? When he was waving his jacket? And, and a lot of people got on to him. And, you know, oh, that's too flamboyant. It's got to be fake. And I said, listen, all he was doing, he was getting bored. And he wanted to branch out and do something different. And everybody blasted him for it. Come on. You, you can't get monotonous. Why are you going to blast him? He's trying to help people. Who cares how he does it? God's big enough to use a waving of it. Okay. Elisha waved a mantle and split the Jordan. Yeah. Benny Hinn can wave his jacket. Come on. <laughs> Amen? Let's, just, let's not get hung up on this stuff. Let's don't make it a doctrine. Yeah. You know? Bless God, I got a jacket waving, anointing. You know? <laughs> no. And so we don't want to do that, right? Don't make it something like that. But <clears throat> I was in uh, Grand Junction. It was that night we had the service. And so this little woman came up. It was a funny something. Too. Little bitty lady. She came up, and there was a deacon standing next to her, kind of holding her there because she seemed really frail and really small. And, just stand, and he stood on the side. And I said, look, I don't have to touch y'all. It's not about this. Jesus does it. And I said, I could, I could stand back here and wave my hand and say, in Jesus' name, you deaf and dumb spirit, come out. And they both, bam, fell down. Didn't touch them. They both fell down, right? And this woman was deaf. Totally deaf. She gets up. Glory to God, she can heal. Uh, here, she can heal too, but she can hear, right? <laughs> and she could start here, and everybody's excited. And that deacon walks over to me, and he goes, Brother Curry, I was deaf in one ear, but I can hear. Wow. And I'm like, Glory to God. That's why Jesus called them deaf and dumb spirits. <laughs> I was aiming for the one and the woman, and the one in you was dumb and didn't know it, and he left it. <laughs> Right? Amen? I, you know, I don't know how accurate that was, but still, right? They both got it. See, we make this thing some religious ritual and make it hard. And listen, listen, people say, well, you know, it takes a long time to get devils to come out. Well, if you plan it for that, guess what? They're going to oblige. But if you tell them to go and you know they got to go, they can leave quick. It doesn't take all day, right? If it's going to take all, you know, if you think it's going to take all day, you better bring a sack lunch because it's going to take all day. Right? So just expect it to be quick. Amen? So I, I could go on and on with all these different, different testimonies of what we've seen all over the world. 
And all I'm trying to do is tell you, listen, whatever God has used me to do, he can use you to do. I'm not special. You know, well, my wife sometimes says, Curry, you are special. You are special. Yes, you are special, right? But she doesn't mean it like other people do. Okay? But I'm not. I'm, I'm normal. I enjoy. I mean, you can see, you know, we joke, we kid, we, we keep it within bounds, and, but, but we enjoy life. We don't walk around here all the time, you know, floating six inches off the ground you know, and all that kind of stuff. And we're not, I'm not walking around in, a, in some kind of cloud. My head's, it's not that way. We enjoy life. We, we, and, the, and you ask my staff, we're normal. We go out to eat, we joke, we, you know. But we can get serious that quick. Whenever somebody needs help, we're ready. Why? And we don't have to go get prayed up and ready. Why? Because we know the Holy Ghost is always with us. Yes. And he's always ready. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, well, we need to get ministering here. <clears throat> so, uh, we're going to... Yes, ma'am. You ready? All right. Uh, see if there's anything else. Uh, yes, one more thing I need to mention. Get ready. Okay? I want to say a special thanks to all of our staff and our volunteers and the people who have done this. Amen. 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 Because I, I'm telling you, I've worked with a lot of different teams, staff members, that kind of stuff, and I'm telling you, this is the best team I've ever had. Best team I've ever had. Uh, they make my job really easy, and they make it easy for me to do what I'm supposed to do, and I don't have to get bogged down with stuff, and so I'm really appreciative of our staff. They make things, and, and their family, you know, the, they're like, I want to say they're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and they are, but most of them are honestly like my kids. Um, they're like my daughters. <laughs> They're like my sons, you know. It's just the way it is. Why? Because God has joined us together, and he's made it easy for me to do what he's called me to do. And so I'm really appreciative because I've worked with other kinds. So I'm really appreciative, okay? So, because it's hard to get really good staff all working together at the same time. But we've got some really good people here. Amen? People that care about the message. And, and I, you know, one of the things that makes them especially good in my mind, in my heart, they don't treat me special. They know I'm just curry. They joke and call me names. <laughs> and, but we get along. And that's what makes this, the atmosphere here so easy to get along because I don't have to walk around acting spiritual. You know, I don't, it was just, look, God is God. He's good. Amen? Amen. And so again, now I also want to thank you for coming. Because we're going to start ministering. When we do, when we minister to you, you're going to be free to leave and free to go. So I guess you've already given an instruction on that kind of stuff. Uh, so you're going to be able to go. And remember, here's the main thing. <clears throat> when you leave, check it out. See what you can do. See what's different. Check yourself before. Check yourself afterwards. Let us know. If you're going to be here tomorrow, let us know. Give us a testimony. If not, text us, call us, write us. We want your testimony. It's good. You overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Amen. So give us your testimony. Let us know what's going on. Amen? Uh, because it, it's, it's helpful and sure. But also, be sure to send in your testimonies of people you minister to. I mean, you've seen a lot of it happen here. You've seen testimonies here. Go do it. Send the testimonies in. Why? Because it encourages other people when they come in that we're able to share your testimony. I love it when I get these letters that people say, they always start the same way. Brother Curry, I never thought God could use me. But that's always a good one. Amen? Amen. So, send your testimonies in, and we're going to get busy. So, I guess uh, if y'all want to go ahead and get started and get them all ready, we will do that. I'm going to take my stuff to the back, and I will be right back out. I was just going to tell you, we had a question that someone said about, uh, why don't we, you know, have more videos out with healings and that kind of stuff. And we actually, it, there's two points to that. Number one, especially in the beginning when I was doing a lot of street stuff, more street stuff by myself, obviously I didn't have anybody with me with a camera. I wouldn't, <clears throat> my, my, okay. I was helping people. I was not trying to build a ministry. And I was interested in getting them healed. I wasn't trying to put it on, you know, there wasn't YouTube, it wasn't popular or anything like that. And so there wasn't that. And I didn't have anybody walking around behind me with a camera <clears throat> that would videotape this stuff. Now, as we've gone out, and, and I like videos, obviously, can, it's good and that kind of stuff. But, but secondly, what I kept seeing was, especially in services, 
people would get healed and they stick a camera in their face and a microphone and go, okay, what is this? What is it? And, and it ended up being just something pointing back to whoever prayed for them. You have to understand two things usually come with a healing, strong healing ministry. Number one, fame. Number two, fortune. Why? Mainly because it's easy for people to pull on that stuff. And when people are sick, it's easy to manipulate their emotions and do that. And so from the very beginning, I saw that stuff and I said, I will not go that way. We will not do it. Now, I, again, I'm not, you know, I, I agree. It's good to have videos and we have things and people get healed and you can see it. But we don't walk around generally always with a camera in their faces. And uh, it's just, to me, it's disrespectful. Amen. Right? I respect your privacy. I respect who you are. I want you well. It, it works. We see it all over. We got testimonies all over the world. And so I'm not concerned about having to get you on tapes or you know, on videos so that this somehow boosts our popularity. I'm not against it. And if I had had someone with me at that time that had a camera and was going, we would have done that. It just wasn't available at the time. But we have lots of stuff out there now. And, and honestly, a lot of things, even when I do minister, a lot of times I'll turn the microphone off because it's nobody's business what your issue is, right? So I understand we would be, honestly, have a whole lot more, uh, you know, YouTube followers and all that kind of stuff. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to build followers. I'm trying to build an army that's out doing this. I don't want people sitting home watching this. Amen? So please understand. And, and we teach this, we show this, and it, and it is. And, and honestly, the videos you see of many other people doing it, that's the same if I'd have done it because I taught them. Right? So I don't, I'm not worried about that stuff. But I agree. And we do, you see some of the testimonies of people and different things. <clears throat> but I just try to not... There's just a path I don't want to go down because it's too easy. And then I see these guys, a lot of times they, you know, they start acting like the rock stars that people treat them like. I just don't want to do that, you know. I'd rather stick around a lot longer without falling off into that ditch. And so let's just, you know, go out and do it. It works. It's the Bible. Okay, let's, okay, let's just say for some, I don't know how, but let's say you could actually do the Bible and it wouldn't work. I haven't told you anything that is a suggestion. What I've given you is what the Word of God said you are to do. It's a command. So even if it didn't work, you're still responsible to do it. All I've done is teach you from the Bible how to do it so that it will work. Right? So just go do what you've learned. It's just that simple. You, you don't... You know, but even if you didn't, you'd still have to do it. Even if it didn't work. I've said before, if every, every person I laid hands on dropped dead instantly, I'd still keep laying hands on the sick. My lines would be shorter, <laughs> right? People wouldn't be too anxious to jump up in that line. You know, it's kind of like, here, let me lay hands on you. No, no, you know. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but I hope you understand my heart in this, right? And, and you, you, can get, you can see the testimony. You can hear the testimony. Many of you have gone, already gone out. You know it works, right? I just don't want to get caught up in that stuff because I see it and then I see the, some of the people that do it and I just don't want to be, I just don't want to do that. Amen? Let's just, let's just be, as we tell everybody, we're just folks. You know? We ain't trying to be anybody. We're just folks. The only name that means anything, the name of Jesus. That's all that counts. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's go ahead.